Okay, so before I start talking about what I want to talk about today, I just want to uh, draw attention to this lovely figure Frank made this morning. Um, this really says a lot, so I hope you have this down somewhere. Um, by the end of Thursday, we believe we'll add a third column to this table, basically. And we'll get to say what all of these things are in, in categories. So that's what we have to look forward to. But before we get there, we have to talk about, um, well, today's topic is behavioral reasoning, but I have a couple things to finish up from last time, so we can do that. So if you recall, uh, last time we defined what a function was. And the idea was that functors should be morphisms between categories. Right? So, because a morphism should be, at least morally, right, some kind of structure preserving half, we ask ourselves, what is the structure of a category that should be preserved? And it's exactly this. So, if you remember, a functor has a domain, a codomain category, and then it has to tell you what to do for the object, and you give a little subscript zero for the object map there, and it has to tell you what to do for the arrow, a little subscript one to the arrow map. And then this has to uh, respect the structure of a category. So first of all, it has to respect the boundary. So if you send an arrow over by the functor, then the domain of the image of the arrow should be the image of the domain of the arrow, right? And similarly to the codomain. And then finally, it should respect what I've been calling the composition structure. And I've been encouraging you to think about this in this um, unbiased way, but the, the sort of typical way is the biased way, where we tell what to do with nullary compositions, which are identities. So if you send an identity over, then you should get an identity. And here's this binary composition. So if you send a composite of two arrows over by the functor, then you should get the functor images of the, the composition of the functor images, right? So the point is, it doesn't matter whether you first did the composition in the domain and then send the whole thing over, or if you send the parts over and then you do the composition in the codomain. Um, and because these subscripts are kind of fiddly, we'll stop writing them, we'll just drop the subscripts. So the dimension at which we're working will be clear from the context, whether F is being applied to an object or being applied to an arrow, we'll just call it F. Okay, so in functional programming languages, this is sometimes called like F map or something, but this part is called F map, but we'll just call both things the name of the function. Okay, so that's where we were. So since we want functors the morphisms of categories, we have to talk about their composition structure in turn. So we have the composition structure of functors. So in order to specify this, I have to tell you what is an identity functor. And then what is a binary composition of functors? So the easiest way to do this is to draw a diagram. So if I have an identity functor on a category C, then I'm going to draw you a diagram in C. A very small diagram. And it should transport this to, well, back to C. And what should it do? Well, it should just apply the identity function to all of the components. So in other words, it should send the A to A, B to B, and F to F. Okay. Well, this is an identity functor, right? So the domain and codomain are the same. So the categories are the same. So this is a little diagram in the category C. This is another little diagram in the category C. And they're the same diagram because the identity functor just applies the identity function to everything in sight. Okay, so then we have to say what a uh, composition of functors is. And again, 
again, I'm going to do this uh, diagrammatically. So if I have two punctures, uh, then, uh, okay, so say F, say I start in the category C, and I have, again, this little diagram, and I apply the puncture F to it that takes me to the category D, then here I will have the F image of A, the F image of B, and the F image of the arrow. And now I want to compose that with the functor G, which takes us to another category, E, let's say. And then what should we get here? Well, we should just get G of F of A. So the point is that composition of functors just composes the corresponding functions at both the object and the arrow level. Right? Okay. So um, using this information, we can conclude that if we have some collection of categories that we now think of as objects, and some collection of functors among them, and then we take all the paths that we can build out of those functors, and we make those arrows. And then we consider identity functors to be identity arrows, and functor composition to be arrow composition. Then we can create a category where the objects are those categories that we started with, and the arrows are the paths and the functors. So we can describe categories of categories. But if we try to do, if we try to sort of get our ahead of ourselves and describe the category of all categories, we run into some foundational problems. And they're very similar to the foundational problems we run into if we try to describe the set of all sets. So we have to be a little bit careful. And so we'll have to briefly consider matters of size. But I don't want this to be a course on foundation, so I'm going to tread pretty lightly in this realm. Uh, the issues are pretty much the same as come up in set theory. But the slogan is, the size does matter. <laughs> but as long as we're, we're not too ambitious, then everything works out fine. Okay, so the story here is that um, If I have a collection, and I have a collection that I apply the adjective small to, then that means I'm just talking about a set. Okay? So a small collection is just another word for set. Small means has some cardinality, if you want to think of it that way. So if I have a category that's small, Then I mean that its arrow collection is small. I mean a set. Okay. So we have a category of small categories. Sets with little identity moves, if you want it, that way. 
Okay, but now if we take the collection of all sets, Russell has already taught us that that's too big to be a set, right? And so the objects of Cat contain at least those, so it's already too big to be a set. So Cat is not an object in Cat. Okay, but typically we don't, or well, in many cases we don't care whether the category is small or not small, sort of in the large globally, we say, but only whether the HOM collections are sets. So a category C is locally small, if all the HOMs are small, that is, if they're sets, Right? And most of the categories that you can plausibly think of turn out to be locally small. So in particular, set is locally small, cat is locally small, and all the ones we've met so far. So from this point forward, I will stop saying hum collection and start saying hum set, if I haven't already slipped and done it already. Um, and we will assume, unless I say otherwise, which I don't think I will, that every category that we need to locally small. Okay, and that's pretty much all I want to say about the use of foundations and size. Okay. Um, if each hom, okay, so what I mean is, if for every A and B, the set of arrows from A to B is this, this is the name of a set of arrows whose domain is A and whose codomain is B. Or I just said set, sorry. The collection of arrows, I have to backtrack. And if, in every case, for each A and each B, this collection of arrows is a set, then C is locally small. Okay. So that, that's the idea of local. It means that there might be too many objects in the category for the category to be small. But if you look at any pair of objects and just consider the arrows between them, then that is set. Okay, so the, the fact that set sort of is where the hum, if you want to think of hum as sort of a function, right, that takes two objects and gives you some collection, that, that the codomain of hum in small categories is set, that fact gives set sort of um, a special position in, in category theory. So, if we fix an object, say x, in a locally small category c, then we can define a function that takes any object a in the category and maps it to the hum set, now I'm allowed to say set, x, Okay. Right. So you give me an object, and I give you back all the arrows from X to the object that you gave me. But this construction extends to a functor, by which I mean we can define it also on arrows, and it obeys the laws for being a functor. So the way that I'll explain express this, it's like this, I name the functor C, X, or of blank, right, this is the name, and now I tell you its type, so its domain is the category C, and its codomain is the category set, and now I have to tell you its action on objects, so I, I already told you that, it takes an object A, and it sends it to the HOM set, X, A, and now I have to tell you what it does on arrows. And what it does is, well, the name we give it is rather uninformative, but it's this. And this is, means take the argument and post compose it with F. Right? So this goes from A, oh, sorry, X to A, sorry, X to two. Right? So you 
you give me an arrow from x to a, I compose f with it, and I end up with an arrow from x to b. So this is just syntactic sugar for lambda of an arrow, and then you take that arrow and you compose it with that. Does that make sense? The idea is really simple. It's just you give me something, if it's an object, then I put it in this slot. If it's an arrow, then I turn it into a function that takes arrows from the domain object that you give me into arrows from x to the codomain object that you give me by just composing it with the arrow that. Okay. <clears throat> and now to check that this thing is a functor, right, what do we have to say? Well, we already checked that it respects boundaries. We've got a little squish, but that's what this bit here says. And then we have to check that it respects the composition structure. So how do we do that? We have to check that if I put in an identity arrow here, that this is the identity function on this set. And for the composition, we have to check that if I put in a composite here, that this is the composition of functions something similar in categories. We can build a category whose component objects and arrows and identities and compositions are all built out of ordered pairs of the respective things from two categories. So in categories, uh, I'm going to say here small to make this a little less tricky. We can define the product Given, well, okay, so given categories C and D, then C cross D has, and now I have to tell you that long list of objects, 
But I told you the idea is that everything is just the order of pairs. So C cross D object set is just the object set of C cross, now this is this crossing set, right? The object set of D. And likewise arrows. Same. Right. The arrow set of the product is the product now in sets of the arrow sets, uh, such that uh, we have three special <coughs> boundaries. So if we have a boundary map applied to a pair of arrows, uh, this. So F is an arrow from C, and P is an arrow from D. Then this is the pair of the boundary applied to F, and the same boundary applied to P. <coughs> and then the identities and compositions are just what you would expect. If I have, if I want to take the identity of a pair of objects, one from C and one from D, then I just take the pair of arrows So the identity arrow on a pair of objects is the pair of identity arrows and the same with compositions If I have a pair of composable pairs of arrows, so let's write that down and then say what it means. So F is an arrow from C, and it's composable with G, which is also an arrow in C. P is an arrow in D, which is composable with Q, which is also an arrow in D. Then this is just the composition F composed G, that paired with P composed Q. Okay, so everything is just done pairwise. The idea, writing it out is a bit tedious, but the idea is very simple. Just do everything pairwise. Okay, so we should think about these terms here, the product of set and product category, as proper nouns. I'm going to put like some quotes around them. Because Tomorrow we're going to meet something called the universal construction of products, which lets us define something that we would like to call a product in an arbitrary category. And we will see when we get there that these two constructions satisfy F, like satisfy the property to be a product respectively in the category of sets and a small category. Okay, but that's something we have to prove. We, we can't just assume. Okay. So the next construction is probably the most important in all of category theory, maybe. Uh, very important anyway. A so question. So, just a clarify, we are only talking about small categories here? Yes, because then the question is, what does it mean to take a product of proper classes, and then that's, or, or whatever, it depends on your set theory, right? So I, I don't want to get into the foundations too much. So for what we're doing, small is sufficient. But if your set theory allows you to talk about products of proper classes or something like this, then you can extend it. <coughs> okay, so so far, I mean, the product construction is something that's very much like what we have in sets. But here is something that's very different, right? Because category theory has this new second dimension, whereas sets are discrete. They just have points. Categories have points and arrows. And so we can take a category, we can uh, form what's called the opposite category. I write 
write it with a superscript O. A lot of people write superscript OP. I'm writing, so I get to name it today. Um, this is called the opposite category of C, right? And now I have to tell you all its parts. So it's objects. So the object collection of C ah is just the same as the object collection of C. They have the same objects. The arrows are the same also, except they're read backwards, right? So in other words, the C op arrows from A to B are the C arrows from B to A. So we just take the boundaries and we formally invert them. We just flip them. So the identity on an object in C op is the same as the identity on that object interpreted as an arrow in C, which is fine, right? Because the two boundaries and identity arrow are the same. So if we formally swap them, we go mess up the boundary. And if we have two arrows and we compose them in C off, then that's just defined to be the composition in the opposite order when thought of as an arrow in C. Right? So literally what's happening is we have <coughs> objects, and they stay the same, and we have arrows. So I, I imagine this is sort of like a, you know, one of those old speaky, this is like the image from Psycho or the Beast Motel, but there's like, I imagine this neon arrow shaft, and then there's a head, right, at one end, and then somebody takes a big switch and flips it, and it turns off the arrow at this end, and it puts the arrow at that end. So there's some switch, and when you flip it, all the arrows get their heads flipped to the other end. That's, that's the idea. The idea is very simple. Okay, so even though this construction is purely formal and very simple, it has very deep consequences, right? And one is, for every construction we can make in a category, if we look at that same construction, but now from the point of view of the opposite category, we get what's called a dual construction. And it turns out that many interesting constructions that we want to make in categories are duals to one another. In fact, um, four, uh, yeah, four of the five propositional connectives that we'll meet, or what we have already met that we'll meet in this context, will turn out to be related to one another, uh, related to one another pairwise by duality. Right? And these duals can interact with each other in interesting ways. So that's something we'll see also. And we also get what are known as dual theorems. And the idea here is that for any theorem that's true in some particular category, there is another theorem, which is the formal dual of it, which is true in the opposite category, but for exactly the same reason. Okay? And as a consequence of this, if you can think of a theorem that's true in every category, then its dual theorem is also true in every category, because every category is the opposite of some category of which the other theorem was true. Okay, so we're going to use duality a lot. Uh, any questions before we go on? Okay, so the question is whether it's valid to use the same name for the arrows in C. Okay, and this is why, so an and arrow comes with some data attached to it. Namely, it comes with its, do, its domain and codomain boundary, and it comes with the category of which it's an arrow, right? So it doesn't make sense to say that F is an arrow without saying F is an arrow of some category. Just like in like typed programming languages, you can't say that something is a term without saying that it's a term of some type. 
right? But that's what this little double colon is here for, right? I'm saying F considered as an arrow in C op composed with G considered as an arrow in C op is the same as is defined to be G considered as an arrow in C composed with F considered as an arrow in C, and I can do that because I said this here, right? If I wanted to put like a little you know, decoration of a prime symbol or a hat symbol or something, then I would have to rename these and then I would have to use that rename. Okay. So now I want to talk about uh, behavioral reasoning, which is the only kind of a reasoning available to us when we want to work purely in categories because we don't know what the objects of our category are. Right? We we can, so um, we're unable to say, like, in set theory, what the members of a set are, or in type theory, what the terms uh, of a type are. All we can say is, what are the morphisms from one object to another? So when we try to define properties or constructions, the only way we can do it is in terms of making statements about the morphisms coming into or going out of a particular object or collection of objects. Okay, so let's move, try to motivate this idea a little bit. Um, if we want to talk about two things being the same, in the, in the category of sets, two sets are the same if they have exactly the same number, right? But that's usually too strict for what we want. We want some notion of essential sameness. And two sets are essentially the same if they're in bijection, right? <coughs> Set is in bijection. And if you remember from wherever you learned this stuff, what it means to be a bijection, this means uh, we have a function. Uh, okay, so we say sets x and y are in bijection if there's a function from x to y that is both injective and surjective, right? And let's remember what these two terms mean. This means if we have, for any two points in the domain, if P sends them to the same place, then they must have already been equal. And this one says, for every point in the co-domain, there's something in the domain that hits it, right? that P sends to it. So this is classical you know, basic foundations of math, or whatever, wherever you learn this. Okay, so, First observation, these two things are defined point-wise. Right? So we're talking about elements in a set. And in category theory, we don't have this structural, we don't have the ability to reason about the, the elements of an object. There's no such concept, right? We just have the morphisms and the objects. So the question is, how can we take these definitions and turn them into characterizations that we can describe in categories? So let's choose this one first, right, and try to figure out how we can say the same thing, but using only language that we can then translate to an arbitrary category. So what we do is we take these two points in the domain, and we consider them to be the images of some point under two different functions, right? So we have um, P is injective. 
if for every f and g from w into x, right, where x is the domain of p, and for all points in w, if p after f of w equals p after g of w, then f of w must have been equal to g of w. So all we've done is we've taken x and x prime and replaced them with the images of f and of w under f and g respectively. Right? So why did we do this? In a way, it seems like we've just made things more complicated for ourselves, right? But now, we remember what it means for two functions to be equal right? in sets, two fun in the category of sets, two functions are equal if they agree on all elements of the domain. Right? So by what's called function extensionality, we have, this is the case, uh, so P is subjective if uh, for all functions F and G, W to X, if F followed by P is G followed by P, uh, uh, then F is equal to G. So we've massaged this in a way that now, notice there's no points. So if we can state this property in an arbitrary category, all we're doing is talking about an equational property that may or may not hold between parallel arrows. And so this is our motivation of a behavioral description of an injective function. to state um, those, those things is uh, to say that W valued points sure. um, when, when they behave the same way under uh, that function P, then they are the same. Yes. So that makes it a little bit closer to the normal notion of being. Yeah, yeah, so we're going to talk about this idea of generalized or varying points <coughs> soon, but yes, that's, that's an equivalent way to think about it. Yes? So, if m is a constant function, then when you precompose it with any function, you always get the same value, right? But that doesn't mean that any two functions are equal.
Yes? So when you apply functional extensionality in the previous board, you essentially push the row identifier inside of the implementation. Yes. Uh, yes, okay. So, yes. <coughs> okay, so, I mean, I did this kind of informally. The point was I want to motivate the idea of how to translate uh, definitions and characterizations that are given structurally, that is by points, into ones that are given behaviorally in terms of the in terms of relationships between objects and arrows. Okay, so yes. I was a little informal about this, but I wanted to like motivate the idea. Okay. Um, so the point is that this notion of a monomorphism is something that we can describe in any category, right? It doesn't make any assumptions about what what category C is. Um, oh, but I should point out that I've been a little economical here in this definition. Right? It's, it's necessary that the arrows F and G are parallel in C. And the way we see that is they must have the same codomain because they're composable with M. And they must have the same domain because those compositions are equal and only parallel arrows could possibly be equal. So F and G are actually parallel. but that's necessary from, from what else I say. Okay, so, uh, oh, and let me give you a little mnemonic in case this is new to you, like because the moment we're going to do the dual to this and it's gonna be confusing which is which, or at least it may be, it was to me when I started doing this. So here's a mnemonic. Uh, the first vowel in the word monomorphism is an O. The first vowel in the word post cancelable is O. And this will help when we get to the dual. Okay, so let's prove a couple quick lemmas. Uh, on monic, so monic is a monic is the adjective for monomorph or monomorphic. Okay, it's the same. It means the same. Um, the lemmas are. Identity arrows are monic. Compositions of monics are monic. And if we have a composition, It's monic. Then the first arrow in the composition is monic. Okay. And uh, let's prove these because they're very quick and easy. But illustrate the style of behavioral reasoning that is the theme of today's lecture. Composition of monics, and we want those to be monics. So we take a composition of monics, 
and we post-compose them with a pair of parallel arrows, and we assume that those are equal. And now the goal is to prove that f equals g. Okay, well we can't do it directly, but we can do it in two steps, because we know that n is monic. So we can cancel that. And now we know that m is monic. So we can cancel that, and we get what we want. In the last case, we have a composition that's monic, and we want to prove that the first arrow in that composition is monic. Right? So suppose, oh, okay, so I gave the names already. So the setup is that we have f composed with m equals g with f, and we want now that f equals g. So we don't know that we can cancel f, right? Because we don't know m is monic, that's what we're trying to show. But we can use the phenomenon that we learned about last time called whiskering, which told us that equality of arrows was a congruence with respect to composition. So this means that we're allowed to postcompose n to both sides of of this equation, and it still holds. And now we're home free, right? Because the assumption was that the composition was monic. So we get that f is g, as we desired. Okay? So these are really simple little proofs, but they give you the flavor of what behavioral reasoning is about. You can't say, suppose x is an element of the domain or something like that, because there's just no, there's no concept of an element of the domain. All we have is the equational theory of the arrow. Okay, so um, let's use our notion of duality that we just discovered, and try to write out what should be erase the slumma, and now we're going to write down what should be the dual property of being monic. Okay, so I'll tell you its name. So it's a post-cancelable arrow in the op category, but that's just a pre-cancelable arrow in the original category. <coughs> and so that is and E and C such that parallel pair of arrows if we compose them after E and those results in equal arrows then those arrows must have been equal to begin with. And now you see the, the brilliance of this little mnemonic. The first vowel in pre is E, first vowel in F is E, now you'll never forget which one is which. But that's why, that's why I intentionally use the words pre and post instead of left and right, because what, even if you write them right to left, right, the thing you do first is still the thing you do first, whether it's on the left or it's on the right. So, one step ahead of you there. <laughs> okay, so I'll give you as an exercise to state and prove. The proofs are actually really easy. The more interesting thing is to state right, the lemmas that are dual to, well, the one I just erased here, but the proofs are, state, are stated up there. So, namely, that identity arrows are 
epimorphism. Oh, really? That's what you're supposed to say. Okay. So now we've seen our first application of duality. We've seen a property defined behaviorally. And so maybe we should think that uh, the idea of being essentially the same in a category is the having uh, is the existence of a monic and epic morphism between the two objects that we want to consider to be the same. But this doesn't quite work. So let me tell you briefly what's going on there. So in the category of sets, it turns out that monomorphisms are exactly the injective functions. And epimorphisms are exactly the surjective functions. But this is not the case in all categories. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Because morphisms aren't necessarily functions in all categories, right? But let's consider an example. In the category of monoids, which we met last time, if we take the map, the inclusion map that takes the natural numbers under addition with zero, and includes, I'll explain this in a second, but let me just write it, it into the integers. So what I mean by includes, I mean take three as the natural number and just send it to three, now interpret it as an integer, and likewise, right? Seven is a natural number, becomes seven interpreted as an integer, right? This function, or this monoid morphism, you have to check that it's a monoid morphism, but it is. This is, it's monic, but more importantly, it's epic. Ep epic is the adjective for epimorphism. Um, but it's not surjective. And that's easy to see, right, because it doesn't hit the negative integers at all. Okay, and, but, but this is a monic and epic morphism in the category mons, and, but it's not enough to give us our idea of what it means to be essentially the same, right, because clearly these two monoids are not essentially the same. First of all, this one has inverses for all of them, and so this one doesn't. This seems like it, it's just, it can't be the right idea. Okay, so we need something else. And the something else comes from souping up the idea of monic and epic morphisms to monic and epic morphisms plus plus. Um, <laughs> All of the features and no bugs. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so these things are called split monic and epic, one at a time. And this is a post invertible. By which I mean an arrow in some category such that we have another arrow in that category, and when you compose that other arrow after this arrow, you get the identity on the domain of S, which is the codomain of R. Okay? So what do you suppose should be the definition of a split epic? Well, if a split monic is post-invertible, what should be its dual? Pre-invertible, right? It's just post-invertible in the opposite category, but that's just pre-invertible in this category. I'll leave it to you to write out the description here. 
But now you see the genius of my mnemonic, right? Because it continues to hold. <laughs> and now you'll never forget that either. Okay, so it would be pretty perverse to name these things this way if split monics were not monics and split epics were not epics, but indeed they are. So let's do one of those. So suppose S is a split monic. We have S followed by R being the identity. And now we want to show that S is monic, right? So the setup is that we take arbitrary F and G and we compose them with S. And now we want to try to post, we want to try to cancel the S's. Okay, well we can't do it directly, but we can use a technique that we just saw a couple minutes ago. Right? We can whisker by R and get that F followed by S followed by R and G followed by S followed by R. And now we're in good shape because we know that S R, S composed R is the identity. Okay, so this is a our assumption. So this is F composed of the identity being G composed of the identity. And you can see where this is going, right? So split monics and epics are more robust versions of monics and epics. So they're robust in a couple ways. One of them is um, over here. Functors must preserve split monics and by duality epics. Right? And we can see that this is not the case necessarily for ordinary monics by looking up there again at that example, which if you believe that it's, uh, and, well, okay, it's in the case of epics anyway, if you believe that it's epics, which I haven't proved, but I've asserted, and it's not too hard to prove. Um, you can take what's called the underlying set functor, which takes the monoid and just forgets the monoid structure and gives you back the set, right? So the underlying set of the left monoid is just the natural numbers and of the right one is just the integers. And now, if we take the functor image of this inclusion, which was uh, an epimorphism, it is just the inclusion of the natural numbers into the integers. But that is not surjective, which we said. But we know in this category of sets, the epimorphisms are just surjective. So we've seen that that underlying set function doesn't preserve this epimorphism. So in a, in a, in a um, precise way that I'm not going to explicate here, uh, functors are more, sorry, split monics and epics are more robust than monics and epics. And they give us the right idea of being essentially the same in an arbitrary category. But before we do that, let's do a really pretty little construction, which I like because it takes something that it's sort of a big deal in set theory, and it gives us a surprising behavioral characterization of it. So in set theory, the axiom of choice says that if we have <coughs> given a family of non-empty sets, There is a function that chooses an element of each. Okay? 
So this is a very structural description of a property. And we're going to see how we can massage this into a behavioral description the way we did with the uh, injective function. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story here. Suppose we have just an arbitrary function. Call it f. And its domain is e and its codomain is b. This is in the category of sets. This is just an ordinary function. Suppose, for sake of concreteness, that uh, E is the set of first-year students at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. <laughs> B is the set of houses, so there's Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and the evil one. Slytherin. Slytherin, right. <laughs> okay. And then up here, so I'm just drawing, like, drawing out what's going on here. And here there's some first year students. So there's Harry Potter, say, and where does he get sent by? Okay, and so this, this function f is sorting the students into the houses, right? So it's sending Harry to Gryffindor, sending Hermione to Gryffindor, sending Ron also to Gryffindor. Gryffindor is pretty full. I'm not sure if anyone lived in Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Whatever the students are, they get sent to their houses. Okay, so this is just schematic, right? And so the point is that I can describe this sorting of one set by another, either using an ordinary function, which sorts the domain by its codomain, or we can describe it in what's known as an index family of sets, right? That's why I'm telling you the story to begin with. Instead of placing the sorting hat on the head of a student and then telling that student which house to go to, you can imagine like a really big sorting hat that you put on each house, and it will tell the house the set of students that are to live in that house. Circle the wrong thing. That's a lonely house. This function we can call f upper star, right? So whereas f tells each student which house to go to, f upper star tells each house which students are living in its house, are living in it, right? And I'm claiming, without being too precise, but it's not hard to make it too precise, that these two characterizations are equivalent. Right? So an ordinary function and an index family of sets are interchangeable in a strong sense, but I'm not going to make too precise. OK, so let's go back to the axiom of choice. Here we have a family of non-empty sets, and we want a function that chooses an element of each. So we want to choose a prefect from each house, basically. right? So what this means is we want a function from houses to students such that when you compose it with f, you get back the same house. Right? So the, the condition that uh, the family of sets um, Not empty is equivalent to the condition that F is a surjection. And that's easy to see, right? Like these sets are not empty just in case there's at least one student that the sorting hat sends to that house. <coughs> okay, so I remember in sets, surjections were the epimorphisms. And the existence of this function, let's call it S, is the condition that uh, that there is a pre-inverse to the function F. Right? So in other words, the axiom of choice
is saying that every surjective function, i.e. every epimorphism, is a split epimorphism. And this is something we could say in an arbitrary category. We've totally eliminated the dependence on, we, have, we, we don't have any reference to membership or sets or anything. Right? This is a property that may or may not hold in an arbitrary category. And so this goes back to what both Bob and I were telling you about in our first lecture, this idea of category theory giving you axiomatic freedom. Right? We can take the axiom of choice and we can require that it hold in some category by requiring that every MB splits. Or we can decide that we don't want to impose that, that requirement and, and not have that axiom. But we can have it either way we like. Right? We're not stuck with one or the other. OK? Uh, started a little late, but I think I get to keep going for a few minutes. Is that right? Okay. So are there any questions about that before we go on? Yes? Um, The axiom of choice is saying that you can, if you've got the family of sets, you can just, from, if each, if each set is on it, you can pick one from. But the other thing that this little diagram which we've seen is that if you you should always, um, if you start with a student and you get the house and you go back along with S, you should get the same student again, right? No, no, it's the other way. Oh. It's, it's, if you pick the students and then you check which houses they're in, Right? That, then, so this, the, fam, the family of students is indexed by the family of houses in this case. Right? Okay, thank you. So that's, that, that's assuring that you're picking a student from each house. That the function is not picking, say, the, the student that it picks for Gryffindor is actually living in Slytherin or something like that. Right. Right? It's checking to make sure that the student is living in the house that you want them to be living in. Okay. Uh, so, let me talk about this idea of split monics and epics in a slightly different way. It's exactly the same idea, but it's just phrased differently.
being a split epic, means having a section. Okay, and now let's try to bring all this together. There's a really cool lemma. <coughs> says if an arrow f has a section, say s, and a retraction say r, then the section and the retraction must be the same. two-sided inverses for each other. So it means that when you compose them in either order, you get the identity. G 
and those that is the identity on D. And again, this is something we can say in any category, right? In contrast to the bijection in sets being injective and surjective, right, we can say that this is, we can make this statement in an arbitrary category. Okay, so a couple facts about uh, isomorphisms. Uh, so, there's an arrow. This, so this arrow is called an inverse. Yeah. An inverse is when they exist. <coughs> so you can try that. It's a pretty easy exercise. Uh, and if we want to say that there exists an isomorphism between two objects in a category, but we're not going to tell you what it is, then we just write a isomorphic B like this, or there exists some isomorphism. objects which have, so if two objects are isomorphic, then if one, if there's an arrow from some other object to one of them, then there's necessarily an arrow to the other. You just compose with, say, F, right? And if there's an arrow out of, um, uh, well, also going the other way, if there's an arrow out of one of these objects to some other object, then you can get an arrow from the other of the isomorphic objects by just composing with the other inverse arrow, so f or g, depending on which way the arrow is going, right? And the composition of f and g are the identity. So behaviorally, isomorphic objects are indistinguishable. And that's what makes this the right notion of equivalence or um, uh, right, so, uh, essentially the same in an arbitrary category. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. I'll take questions. <coughs>